Welcome to the Utah Retirement Systems webinar series. While this webinar has been pre-recorded, the information is still relevant. Please see the description below for links to the different sections within the video and other helpful information. We hope you find this webinar to be a useful resource in your retirement planning. We're talking about spending your retirement savings and specifically we are going to focus on Spending money, say, out of 401ks, IRAs, etc., 403bs, maybe if you're in the school system, um, and ways either, you know, if you want to spend your money faster or slower, maybe some ways you can make it last longer. We'll talk through some different strategies and ideas on that. It may help, though, just to kind of give you a sense of putting these plans in perspective, Think of these really as like ATMs. They are cash machines. So your 401k, your 457, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, of course, good news with Roth is they are tax-free. So you can kind of think of those as invisible ATMs. So for instance, uh, if I've got $100,000 in my 401k, and if I take that out all in one year, Uncle Sam is going to be very happy with me because I just wrote myself a $100,000 bonus check and I will probably wind up paying a lot more in taxes on it. But if I have 100,000 in my Roth IRA, man, I can take 100 grand out of that. Uncle Sam won't see any of it. But these are like ATMs in the sense that once you drain them, they're done for. That's kind of the end of the story. But you do have the flexibility to spend more or less whenever you want to. And that's some of the nice features about these different types of saving plans. All right, so let me start by asking you guys a question. How much do you think you could, say, take out of your retirement account per year and not run out of money? And again, we're thinking 401ks, IRAs, maybe 403bs if you're in the school system. What do you think? How much could you take out if you kind of wanted to make sure you'd make your money last the rest of your life? What's a What's a reasonable amount you think you might be able to withdraw? So go ahead and vote if you want to. It's all anonymous. And then we can, uh, we'll talk about the results here in just a second or two. All right. So it looks like a lot of you are saying about 5%. And there's really kind of not a right answer to this question. Maybe the way to say it, the more conservative answer is, yeah, probably somewhere in that 4 to 5% range. Again, it depends on your age and how long you want the money to last. But there is, in the retirement planning world, uh, kind of this 4% withdrawal rule. Um, and if you really want to know more about it, you can Google it and um, do some research on it. But the idea is, is maybe if you take about 4% per year out of these um, accounts, you can make them last 25, maybe 30 years. And, that depends on a lot of factors, how the money's invested, etc. But that's just kind of the general, general idea. All right, so let's move ahead then. So we're going to look at three different types of spending strategies today. These all have pros and cons, and we'll look at each of these individually. Let's start with the idea of this fixed dollar amount. So this one's pretty straightforward. Basically, you just say how much you want per month or per quarter or per year, whatever it might be. And it's just a fixed dollar amount. So yeah, I want $100 a month. I want $500 per quarter. I want $2,000 per year. And it's very, very straightforward. Now, the upsides to that is it's pretty easy to, uh, to, to implement and or, and or change. Because anytime you want more or less taken out, you just tell URS or wherever you're retirement account happens to be, you want X amount of dollars and you can change it whenever you want to. It's also kind of nice because from a budget standpoint, you know how much is going to be coming in from that account and that can certainly help with tax planning. Uh, again, if it's a taxable retirement account like a 401k or a traditional IRA. But there's also potentially some downsides to it. So let me ask you real quick, and we're going to bring up, uh, we call it kind of like our little chat box. And there's, again, no right answer to this, but let me ask you this. What do you think some of the downsides to this fixed dollar amount strategy might be? So take, a, take just a second, think about that. Upside, stable income, 
helps with budgeting, but there are some downsides to it as well. And if you have some ideas, you know, if, you, if something just jumps to mind and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, uh, hmm, that might not be such a great idea after all. What are some of the downsides to this? So chat away. This is our chance to get you involved, get you thinking. And, uh, and sometimes you guys give us new and good ideas because we don't claim to be all-knowing when it comes to these things. Okay, so a couple of you have mentioned things like, uh, so inflation, yep, that's definitely one. Uh, we'll, we'll swing around on that on just a second. Uh, yeah, if you have an unexpected expense, maybe, uh, but the nice thing again with 401ks, 457s, if you do have an unexpected expense, remember, you can take out as much or as little as you want um, anytime you want to. Let's see, what else? Fluctuation in the stock market? Yep, that could definitely ha uh, affect it as well. Let me give you some thoughts on this. So, one of you mentioned inflation. Definitely something to be concerned about. So, say if your average life expectancy in retirement is 20, 25 years, something like that, you can pretty well figure that food, gas, utilities, they're going to be more expensive 20 years down the road in retirement. Well, if you're still taking... $50 a month out of your retirement account, 20 years later, 50 bucks isn't going to go near as far. And so your, your buying power, your standard of living, if you just hold it at that fixed dollar amount, is, uh, is definitely going to be reduced or diminished. Also, there's no guarantee how long this money's going to last, right? Because if you keep taking the same dollar amount, one of you mentioned fluctuations, say, in the markets. Yeah, if your account value is falling, over the years because the investments are dropping and you're pulling money out, again, that money is not guaranteed. It's not going to last for life for sure. But again, upside, it's an ATM. You can always slow down how much you're spending. So another strategy is what we call the fixed percentage. And with this one, you just take a set percentage of, say, your prior year in balance. So Here's a simple example for this one. Say I've got $100,000 at the end of last year. I want to take 4% of that. So this year I take 4% out of uh, $4,000 out of it. And then I just repeat the calculation each and every year. And all I'm doing, I'm just constantly doing that fixed percentage, whether it's 4% or 35 or 5 whatever the case may be. So what are some of the advantages to this one? Well, it's pretty easy to implement, right? It's just whatever last year's balance is, multiply that times whatever desired percentage is, and you're done. That's pretty simple when it comes to doing that. Now, are there some downsides? You bet. So let me ask you again, get your thoughts. Think again, what might be some potential downsides to the fixed percentage approach? Okay, so let's open up the chat box again, and if you have thoughts and ideas on what could be some potential downsides to taking a fixed percentage over the years. I'll give you just a minute or so. If you have any ideas. So a couple of you mentioned things. Yep, the amount could reduce over time. Yep, that's definitely one of them. Depending on how the money's invested, could be worth more, could be worth less. Inconsistent budget, yep, because the spending is going to potentially fluctuate from year to year as well. Difficulty in planning, yep, I would agree with that as well, because again, that spending can be variable. So, yeah, you guys pretty well nailed it. Yeah, uh, one year you might have you know, a higher dollar amount, again, depending on how the, uh, how the investments perform, what percentage you're taking out. But another year, you could wind up with less. So it can make budgeting a little more difficult, uh, you know, in terms of planning a spending pattern. And uh, again, the downside here, it's not guaranteed for life. Now, mathematically, theoretically, could you ever totally deplete this account? No, but I mean, you can imagine if you got down to ten dollars in your 401k and you said well I'm going to take four percent of it okay yeah you're not going to run out of money probably but 
uh, for all intents and purposes, you really, really have. So a little variation on the fixed percentage is fixed percentage adjusted for inflation. And here, again, you just take that set percentage, that initial set percentage, and then each year you just bump it up based on the prior year's rate of inflation. So our example here, I have $100,000 at the end of the year. My first year in retirement, I'm going to take $4,000 out. The next year comes along, and inflation for that year was 2.5%. So I do a little math, 4,000 times 1.5% to keep up with inflation. Now I take 4,100 the following year. And then the year after that, maybe inflation's 2%, and on and on it goes. Some upsides to this, you get to kind of maintain your purchasing power, which is always kind of a good thing. Uh, again, like we talked, you know, especially over 10, 15, 20 years, Potentially, your income is going to go, be going up every year because of that inflation adjustment. But again, it could vary from year to year, right? Because your investment could drop in value. Pretty easy to implement. Takes a little bit more math because you've got to make a recalculation every year. But it's just a once a year thing. And like we talked about earlier with the, um, the other fixed percentage approach, again, it's not guaranteed for life. Theoretically, yeah, for, yeah it could last. <laughs> amazingly long periods of time, but for all intents and purposes, it's really not guaranteed for life. The last approach to think about is what we call the RMD approach. And RMD just means required minimum distribution. These follow IRS guidelines. Traditionally, these have applied at age 70 and a half. The rules on that just changed. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. But traditionally, it applies at 70 and a half. And at that point, there are factors published in IRS tables that tell you for each and every year, based on your age, how much you would need to take out. So for instance, if I was 70 last year, I look at my prior year balance, $100,000. I look up the factor in the IRS table, it's 27.4, and I divide that into my 100,000. That's the minimum that I would need to take out per year. So in this example, 36.50. But there are factors for ages even prior to age 60. So for some of you, for instance, you're in retirement. Let's say you've retired at 60 or 62 or whatever. If you wanted to, you could start using these RMD factors at that point and figure out how much you could take out per year. Uh, and if you do a little bit of math, you can basically convert the factors into these different percentages. So in your 60s, you'd be taking out 2 to maybe 3%. By the time you hit your 70s, you're in the 3.5, maybe 4% range. Basically, the older you get, the higher the percentage becomes over time. So as we've looked at earlier, there are some pros and cons to doing that. The upside to this approach, uh, if you do the math based on the IRS factors, you do have guaranteed income to about age 115. Theoretically, at that point, you're running out. Now, for most of us, that's probably not an issue. Not too many of us live to 115. But if one of your concerns was, I want to make sure my money lasts a pretty long time. I got longevity in my family. We live in our 90s, maybe even early 100s. Well, this RMD approach might be one you want to take. And as we looked at earlier, because it's an increasing percentage, you certainly have the potential for increased income every year. Again, that's going to depend on how the investments perform. Now, let me ask you guys again, though. Well, OK, those are the upsides, possibly, to the RMD approach. What might be some downsides to, to taking this RMD type approach? What might be some disadvantages for it? So if you have some thoughts on maybe what the downsides might be, go ahead and type in your thoughts. We kind of want to keep you guys involved, keep your brains going, give your fingers a chance to get a little workout this morning. So if you have some thoughts on uh, what some downsides might be, take just a minute and, uh, and type those in real quickly. All right, let's see what we're thinking about here. Living on less than the other approaches, probably, right? Because, yeah, if you're taking the RMD approach, and maybe you're only taking 2 to 
certainly less than uh, if you were taking sort of the traditional rule of thumb, maybe 4% to 5%. Unspent savings before you die. Yep, one of the, that could definitely be one of the downsides. Um, for some of us, our 401ks, IRAs, our money that we need to have for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, we, we just don't have enough overall social security or pension income or whatever. Uh, but for some of us, 401ks, IRAs are just their fun money. You know, if we have sufficient social security, sufficient pension income maybe, then um, maybe our 401ks, IRAs are fun money, in which case uh, let's spend those ATMs as fast as we want to and have a good time with them. All right, let's see what we have, what some other thoughts are. So as we kind of looked at with the percentage um, approaches earlier, yeah, that income does vary from year to year. And uh, kind of like the, also like the other percentage approaches, it, there's a little bit more work because you do have to calculate, recalculate that amount every year. Let's see, and let's see, what else? Uh, if you want 401k as backup, funeral expenses, uh, like for funeral expenses, that would certainly work fine. Um, 401ks, depending on you've na whom you've named as beneficiary, um, uh, theoretically if you pass away that money goes directly to the beneficiaries and then it would be potentially up to the beneficiaries maybe to pay funeral expenses for you, but they could certainly use 401k or IRA money to do that if they wanted to. Now, I mentioned that the rules had changed a little bit. Um, so 72 is the new 70 and a half. So if you have turned 70 in 2020 or later, those required, min uh, required minimum distributions now begin at age 72. Now, if you were born on July 1st, 1949 or later, you're basically in the, in the new, you fall into the new category. And this came about because of the SECURE Act, which uh, was signed into law in uh, late 2019. So just a little update there. So if you are nearing retirement age or you are in retirement, uh, again, depending on when you turn 70, that can affect uh, whether, whether and when you might need to start those new, those required minimum distributions. By the way, we do have another webinar um, just on required minimum distribution. So, uh, and you can find that on the U.S. website if you are interested in that, if you want to know more about the details there. So that kind of sums up our webinar. A uh, couple different strategies we've talked about, fixed dollar amount, fixed percentage, the RMD approach. And again, we just looked at some simple pros and cons to each approach. And what's right for you is probably going to be different than for a neighbor, your buddy that you're working with. So again, everybody's different. But these are some general thoughts and ideas for you to think about. And as I mentioned, we do have other webinars available. Uh, you are also always welcome to call our 401k department. If you have questions on these strategies, you can sit down with one of the retirement advisors like myself one-on-one, -on -one, and we can chat with you further about these as well.